Welcome to the Compass Church Online. We're so glad that you're joining us and welcome specifically to my home. Um, I'm Ian, I'm the worship leader from our Bolingbrook campus and I am so glad that you're joining us through this online experience. You know, I know that over these last few weeks, we've all had different days and different weeks. Um, some of us have had some really incredible days and others of us have really had some really struggling days. You know, no matter what season you're in, um, no matter what kind of days you've been having, I just want you to know that, that God asks us to bring a sacrifice of joy. And the reason he does that is because he knows the power of worship the power that he gives us, the hope that he gives us through himself. And so I just want to encourage you as we sing this first song, would you just not be afraid of what people say or think and just lift up your voices, lift up your lives in this moment. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. You are good. Promise. 
promise never to forsake Which you began you will sustain This we know This we know I will call upon the Lord For He alone is strong enough to save Rise, your shackles are no more For Jesus Christ has broken every chain All of the heavens and the earth Announce the fullness of your word This we know This we know And every enemy will flee You sweet declare your victory This we know This we know Let's lift up our voices here and sing Jesus' name. Jesus' name will break every stronghold. Freedom is ours when we call his name. Jesus' name above every other. Oh, heal the power of Jesus' name, Jesus' name will break every stronghold. Freedom is ours when we call His name, Jesus' name above every other. Oh, kill the power of Jesus' name. Oh, kill the power of Jesus' name. Jesus' name. I will call upon the Lord, for He alone is strong enough to save. Rise, your shackles are no Jesus Christ has broken every chain. I will call upon the Lord, for He alone is strong enough to save. Rise, your shackles are no more, for Jesus Christ has broken every chain. so glad for the gift of music that so uniquely reminds us of some pretty incredible truths that God is strong to save that he never abandons us he's good and his power can actually strengthen us to rise and stand strong in him so thanks Ian for leading us to remember that today friends can I just throw this out there that waiting is hard you know it's something I'm challenged with regularly how about you I'm just not good at it. And well, we're all in this waiting together right now. The reality is waiting is just a part of life, right? But regardless of whether our, our waiting feels easy or hard at the moment, do you know that how we wait is actually shaping the people that we are becoming? This is why I believe worship is essential in the waiting, because a Godward perspective helps us to persevere with patience and with hope. And Psalm 27 illustrates this principle in action so beautifully. Though the psalmist opens with the confident question, whom shall I fear? We find that he really has much to fear as he waits for his deliverance. 
And there's a temptation even in our waiting that fear longs to trap us. And the psalmist feels the temptation to be lured into fear. Yet I love that his eyes can see more than the distressing nature of his circumstances. And friends, worship makes all the difference. In verse 6, he declares that even in the midst of his trouble, that he will offer up a sacrifice of joy and he will sing to the Lord. Did you catch that? A sacrifice of joy. It means he had to choose to give up something to take hold of joy. And the end result of his worship is courage and confidence, not in himself, but in the Lord, and a willingness to wait for God's deliverance and to wait with hope. Look how he closes out Psalm 27. He says, I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. And he says again, wait for the Lord. You know, I believe that when we catch a bigger vision of the heart of God in the midst of our worship, then we're well prepared for the waiting that lies before us. And we won't stagnate in our waiting, but we'll grow and we'll be blessed by it. And I wonder if, like the psalmist today, you'll see the difficulty in the waiting now, yet you'll choose that sacrifice of joy and worship God for who he is and what he has done and, and continues to even do. So speaking of that, why don't we continue to worship now as we sing. Will you join us? So Lord, I come. I need you.
then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. Come on, tell him how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art. Bearing, send him to die. I scarce can take it in that on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior died to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou Shouts of acclamation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart? Then I will bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God. How high today. We worship you in your greatness. And uh, we just want to tell you that we love you today, Lord. We thank you that um, you are the God who is with us even now in the waiting. And so we look to you, Lord. We thank you that we can call out on your name, the name of Jesus, that there is strength and power and joy in your name. And so, Lord, we lean into that today, into your presence. We thank you for your presence that is here with us right now. Would you pour out your love on us, pour out your peace and your comfort on each one of us today. And God, continue to teach us, Lord, now as we lean in and hear from your word in just a moment. We sing, we pray all of this in the mighty, powerful name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said, amen. Friends, how are you doing with this quarantine? Is it getting old? You know, I've discovered that quarantine can teach us two really important truths about relationships. Have you noticed this? The first thing it can teach us about relationships is their value. Friends, when we're stuck in isolation away from extended family, coworkers, friends, 
it can be just maddening. My poor wife, she's just a raving extrovert and she's going crazy just saying, I need my people to be with me. And I'm like, hey, am I chopped liver? What's with me? You know, she's just growing a little weary of the same four people every day. I bet you've recognized as you're forced to stay away from people how precious relationships are. Friends, one of the greatest gifts God gives us is friendship. Second thing that we learn from this quarantine is that relationships are hard. Man, are they difficult. Have you noticed that these days it feels like we're lab rats stuck in a cage, you know, like some freak show. Hey, let's pack these people into a house and make them live 24-7 together. It just tests your patience, your ability to show love and kindness to others, and maybe some of the weaknesses in your relational abilities is coming out in the midst of this test. Friends, we're going to talk about relationships. We've got a six-week series coming up on sharpening our people skills. Uh, I'll just ask, do you have relational deficiencies? Are there any skills, relationally speaking, that you could use some fine-tuning, some growth? We all do, every single one of us. Maybe this season is bringing those to the forefront more than ever. Well, in this series, we are going to learn how to build relationships. We're going to strengthen, by God's Word, those skills that help us build healthier, more vibrant relationships. You know, that's what makes someone rich. I heard a saying that true wealth is defined not by the quality of your investments, but the quality of your relationships. It's really true. And so by God's grace, we're going to get good at this relationship building thing so we can be truly wealthy. And you know who we're going to learn from? Jonathan from the Old Testament. Have you heard of him? He was a prince. He was the son of the very first king of Israel, King Saul. And Jonathan has been called an unsung hero. And I think that's true. This guy, need, I've, never, I've never preached on him. And, and he needs the focus. We need to focus on him. Particularly because of the expertise of his relational skills. He, he was a relational pro. We're, we're going to study his relationships at home with family and at work with co-workers and with friends. And he's going to teach us the keys to being outstanding when it comes to building relationships. You know, the entirety of this series, we're going to be in the book of 1 Samuel today, specifically 1 Samuel 14. That's where the story of Jonathan begins. Here's what it says, verse 1. Jonathan, son of Saul, said to his young armor bearer, Come, let's go over to the Philistine outpost on the other side. But he did not tell his father. Friends, let me just unpack some of the terms that are found in this text to understand exactly what's going on here. First of all, the Philistine outpost. Uh, the Philistines, they were the arch enemy of the Israelites. They were a fierce, seafaring people that lived west of Israel. In fact, they were on the Mediterranean Sea. Maybe you've heard of the Gaza Strip. That was the land of the Philistines. In fact, Gaza was one of their capital cities. Well, they were fighters. They were military people, trained well, huge army, and no one could outdo them when it came to weaponry. They were metal workers and therefore had some of the most innovative weapons that were around. They had already uh, conquered the Israelites. In a moment, shall we call it grace, they didn't wipe them out. They allowed them to live, but they took all of the swords and spears of the Israelites, leaving them without any weapons. Well, actually, there were two people. I guess they hid two weapons. A sword ended up with the king, King Saul, the very first king of Israel, and his son, Jonathan. They were the only two in all the nation that had a sword. Well, 
th that's the Philistines. What, what, what's going on when it says his father? I just want to speak for a moment about King Saul. In this moment, King Saul is frozen. He's paralyzed with fear. The situation is that his army had been vastly reduced due to desertion. Seeing that they're without weapons and seeing the approach of the Philistines who have decided we've grown impatient with the Israelites and we just want to wipe them out, the Israelite soldiers are defecting. They're running, either giving up and going over to the Philistines or hiding. And as a result, uh, Saul's army has gone from 3,000 down to 600. Four out of five have bailed. And with only 600 soldiers left, Saul is just freaking out. Now, it's kind of laughable in some ways because Saul was the, picked as the king because he was the biggest, uh, head taller than everybody else, the strongest, the most confident, handsome man in all the land. And yet in this moment, he didn't know what to do. People are like, hey, the Philistines are coming on to attack. And he's like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I imagine Jonathan came to him and said, come on, dad, you got to go. You got to charge. And he would have none of it. He's like, no, son, we can't. We can't. Jonathan has gotten to a place where he says, listen, if my dad won't go, I will go. Somebody's got to move. God can't bring the victory unless we have the courage to go forward. So he didn't tell his father. He knew his dad wouldn't go for it. So he secretly went off on this mission. I want to highlight uh, other side. Other side of what? Uh, the, the Philistine outpost on the other side? Well, here's the situation. They were in uh, a ravine, uh, a river, cut a ravine, creating sharp cliffs on this side and on this side. And the Philistines were up on the north side cliff and the Israelites were up on the south side cliff. And uh, this ravine posed the place where this great drama was about to ensue. So let me now highlight the word outpost. This is a reference to a small band of soldiers, Philistine soldiers, that were on the outside of the main camp. The majority of the Philistine soldiers were to the, the west. That was the, the central army. But they had taken 20 of them and sent them to a spot a little to the east to protect them from a, a possible attack. Jonathan recognized that a group of 20, may, maybe we could win that battle. And so he's focused his strategic attack on this 20 soldier outpost. Now let's go and highlight the, the term armor bearer. Yes, that's what we're looking at, a friendship between Jonathan and his armor bearer. You say, well, what was an armor bearer? Well, what does it sound like? Someone who bears or carries the armor, the shield, the sword, the, the helmet. But lest you think that this guy's just a glorified pack mule, you should know that this is one of the most prestigious positions in all the land. First of all, Jonathan is the prince. And to be hand-selected by the prince for this role was a tremendous honor. First of all, you should know that this armor bearer was probably one of the, if not the greatest soldier in the entire army. He would have been picked to serve alongside Jonathan because of his military prowess. And so Jonathan respected his ability and Jonathan trusted his character. That was one of the important things about an armor bearer is that Jonathan was trusting him with his life. He said, you have character. I know you'll have my back and won't back down on me. And so, friends, what we're going to look at is this profound relationship that developed between Jonathan and his armor bearer, a work relationship that was amazingly beautiful. Let me show you just how beautiful it was. Here, I'm reading now in verse 7. The armor bearer says this. He says, do all that you have in mind, his armor bearer said. Go ahead. I am with you, heart and soul. <laughs> Isn't that an amazing statement? Do all that you have in mind. I don't know what you have in mind, Jonathan. 
Just the two of us going on an attack sounds crazy. I don't need to understand. Let's do it. There, there was trust. There was confidence in Jonathan as his leader. But then he says, go ahead. I am with you heart and soul. Wow. This is an amazing friendship here. Not only does he trust his leadership, but he believes in his friend Jonathan so much that he says, listen, I'm not just submitting to your authority and doing what you say because you're my boss. You are my boss. But he says, I'm, I'm not just reluctantly going along with your command. I'm with you heart and soul. You and me, buddy, let's do this thing. An amazing statement of two friends who have been knit together, heart and soul. Do you have a heart and soul friend? It's what you want. We all want that. I remember being blown away by one of my friends. This was a long time ago. It was when I first felt called to plant a church. I was only 24 years old, and I had met a guy in seminary. He and I, my wife, his wife, the four of us were going to start a new church. And I called up one of my high school buddies. His name is Bob. If you've been around at the Compass Church for a while, you may recall me speaking of Bob. Bob and his wife, Sherry, were now living in Hawaii, paradise. They had both gotten jobs on that garden island, and they were living the life. Well, I just called Bob on the phone, and I said, Bob, I just want you to know I'm off on a new adventure. We're going to plan a church. Bob was blown away. He was cheering me on. Jeff, that's awesome. Two days later, Bob calls me, and he says, my wife and I have talked. We are leaving Hawaii. We are moving back to the mainland. We are the first members of your new church. And I'm like, Bob, no, 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 you can't do that. I go, the truth is, I don't even know where we're going to start this church. We're looking at six different cities spread over four states. Bob says, Jeff, it doesn't matter. Uh, we feel God's call to support what you're doing. And wherever you go, we go. We're in this. Bob was saying, Jeff, this is a heart and soul commitment. We are friends and devoted to the Savior together. I was blown away. Now, just to be frank, uh, six years ago, I came to the Compass Church in Naperville, Wheaton, and Bob didn't follow me here, but, you know, we're still great friends. Love that guy. I uh, just spoke to him recently. And such a special, precious friendship. That's what friends can be. And when we find these heart and soul committed, devoted, just so much feeling a love for one another, that's something really special. That's what Jonathan had with this armor bearer. And now we got to ask the question, how did he build relationships like that? What did Jonathan do that helped him get so close? Well, let's continue our study and find out. So I've entitled today's message, The Sharing of Life, because we discover that Jonathan established a profound friendship with his armor bearer by sharing his life. Jonathan understood that for a relationship to be deep, you've really got to give of yourself and share life. And one of the ways that he shared his life with this armor bearer was by sharing his heart. As they were contemplating this attack, just the two of them against 20, Jonathan said something that is very vulnerable, very beautiful. Let me read it to you now. This is uh, 1 Samuel 14, 6. Jonathan looked at his armor bearer and said, Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. You know, nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. Friends, that's a profound statement. We, we have in those words, uh, Jonathan really giving a glimpse into his heart, what's going on inside of him, what's going on in his mind. And that's what we need to do. We need to be vulnerable, transparent with those we're seeking to build a strong friendship with. Well, what do we find that Jonathan is sharing as he shares his heart? Well, one, he's revealing his dreams. Uh, here, I want to highlight the words saving and Lord will act. 
He's saying, I have a dream to be involved in the saving business. I, I, I want to be part of a grand rescue. God's people, the Israelites, are in danger from annihilation. But I believe that God uses people, that God will act through us to save the day. It's a dream. One of the things you can share with your friends is your dreams. Well, what is it deep down that you'd long, you'd love to see God do in you and through you? That's what Jonathan's doing. He's saying, I want to be a part of something greater than myself, some mission of profound significance where God's at the very core of it. Sometimes we're afraid to talk about God at all and our God-given dream. Friends, if you don't, if you stick with the sports, or actually, not much sports to talk about these days, or the weather or the quarantine, you know, you can just deal with surfacey stuff. You need to reveal the heart if you want a relationship to be deep. He shares in this phrase his dreams. I would add also his discoveries, his spiritual discoveries. When he says, nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. That's something he's learned. He studied the word of God and he say, you know what I've learned about how God works? He saves by few. In fact, it doesn't matter how few. Uh, Jonathan has studied the book of Judges, to be specific. The book of Judges teaches this lesson in spades. In fact, one of the judges is Gideon. And with Gideon, God specifically said to him, reduce your army. God got Gideon to reduce his army down so small that that army was outnumbered 450 to 1. And yet with Gideon's small band, God brought a great victory. And Jonathan knew about that story of old. Another one is Shamgar, one of the judges. The Bible says Shamgar went one on 600. And all he had was an ox goad, which is a farming implement. And God brought victory to Shamgar. Jonathan read about that and he's like, oh, that's good stuff. I want to live that. Another judge is Samson. The book of Judges says that Samson used a donkey jawbone to kill a thousand Philistines. Jonathan said, I've learned something from the scriptures, and that is nothing can stop God from saving, whether by many or by few. And one of the ways we can reveal our heart is to reveal what we're discovering in the word of God, what we're learning. I I get together with a group of guys in my small group every week these days via Zoom. And one of the questions we ask is, what is God teaching you these days? What are you learning? And friends, if you're transparent about your spiritual discoveries, what God's teaching you in life or through his word, that's a great way to reveal your heart. And so what do we find? He he revealed his dreams, his discoveries, even his doubts. I love the word perhaps. Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Is Jonathan trying to act like some super believer who has no doubt, who just knows it all? No, he's being real. He's being transparent. He's like, I don't know. Maybe we'll die. Perhaps God will work on our behalf. I love the realness where he just says, I'm not certain what God's going to do in this moment. And friends, if you're not certain, that's okay. Be real, but share your heart with your friends. Give, let them have a glimpse into what's going on deep inside. You know, uh, I learned this from my friend Bob. Back where we, when we were in high school, I have to admit that I was a very surfacey person. All of my conversations were about ankle deep stuff. And I remember Bob as our friendship was just developing. I'd be dropping him off at his house. I'd pull my Trans Am into the driveway, expecting him to get out. And Bob would just crank back the seat and he said, Griffin, let's talk. And I didn't feel real comfortable sitting in a driveway in a car with a guy, but I said, what do you want to talk about, Bob? And he would just start sharing of his dreams and sharing of his discoveries and sharing of his doubts. He got so real with me. And at first I I was in territory I was unfamiliar with, but eventually Bob showed me what a conversation of substance was. 
And the friendship that I enjoy today is in part because I have learned from Bob what it means to share your heart, to not tolerate surfacey conversations, but to press in deep to the substance of the soul. That's what Jonathan did to his armor bearer. And that's a huge part of the reason that their relationship was a heart and soul kind of friendship. Friends, let, let, let's press on, shall we? What did Jonathan say next? Verse 8 says, He said to his friend, Come on then, we will cross over toward them and let them see us. <laughs> This has got to be like the worst battle plan I've ever heard. We'll cross over in that, that wadi, that ravine, and then we'll let them see us? Really? One of the advantages in military conquest is to maintain your position as a secret. But Jonathan's like, no, 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 I got a plan. We're just going to go I'm out in the open. 20 guys will see us. And Jonathan goes on to say, and if they say, come on up, we'll know that that's God's sign that he's going to give us victory. And uh, this armor bearer was like, all right, bro, let's do it. And so they went out there. And sure enough, the Philistine soldiers saw, saw them, started to mock them. They said, oh, look, the Hebrews are coming out of the holes they were hiding in. And then they said, we're going to teach you guys a lesson. Come on up here. Jonathan was like, boom, there's our sign. That's what we were looking for. Armor bearer, let's go. Verse 13 says that Jonathan climbed up the cliff using his hands and feet with his armor bearer right behind him. So, verse 14 says, In his first attack, Jonathan and his armor bearer killed some 20 men in an area of about half an acre. Friends, can you believe that? I mean, it's like just a small little area, and Jonathan and his armor climbed to the top. Maybe they had to tell the Philistines, one minute, one minute, and then it's like it's in a movie, you know, 20 on two. And all of a sudden, Jonathan is like, whack, whack. And wouldn't you know, God gave them victory. And those two guys defeated 20. Isn't that amazing? Jonathan said to his armor bearer, you and I, on a mission for God, let's do it together. It's the second way we share our life. The, the first is we share our heart. The second is we share our quest you know, life is a quest if you're living for the Lord. And this is a chance for you to say, you know what, I want to do it with you. When you invite a friend to join you in serving the Lord in some capacity, it's a way that lives are bonded together. You know, making these preaching videos, I, I miss you all so much. Can't wait till we worship together. But making these videos and beautiful places like this is a lot of fun. And part of the reason I enjoy it so much is because I do it with my friend. I, I have my friend Andy here. Andy, let me just see, see you. Andy and I have been serving together for 20 years. From my last church to here, the two of us are friends, and it's our job to work together to serve the Lord in these unique ways. And he and I bond and laugh and get tired and press on and by sharing our quest, friendship is knit together. Now, maybe it's not, you know, I don't make any movies. Sometimes the quest can be as simple as enduring a quarantine. My, my wife, I was so proud of her. She, she decided last week to go door to door. We have, we have 25 houses on our street. And Jen decided to give a, an Easter, this is before Easter, a, a little Easter 
what do you call it? Ding dong ditch present. Uh, Jake and Jen went to each doorstep, dung the doorbell, left a little care package. There was a roll of toilet paper and some Easter eggs, but then a note, a note that cast vision and said this, in a quarantine, it's important that we face it together as a neighborhood. And she said, what if we were to form a group text and we said that if anybody gets sick, if anybody's in need, we'll be there for each other. How about we do this together? It was so impressive. Right away, 15 of the 25 households texted into Jen and said, sign me up. So glad you initiated this. Let's, let's do it together. Friends, any challenge we face together bonds people. You're not just neighbors anymore. You're, you're friends. So who can you share your quest with? Who can you, in your family, uh, work, neighborhood, say, hey, let's do this thing together, shall we? Because in sharing your life, one your heart, and the other your quest, friends, bonding happens. It's not shallow friendship, it's deep friendship, like Jonathan and his armor bearer. And friends, I pray that each of us will have the courage to step out of our comfort zone, find those people we feel God leading us to deepen the relationship with, and share our life. In fact, I'd like to pray for you that God would give you the courage to take steps in, in obedience to what we've learned. Will you, will you pray with me? God, in this season of quarantine, we realize the importance and the challenge of relationships. And God, we give you this whole series, the study of Jonathan, and ask that you would use it to mold us and grow us in our people skills, and particularly the gutsy move to share life. Would you help my friends identify people and identify ways that they can share their heart and share their quest and bond in very unique ways? God, please do that for my friends. Even this week, we pray this in Christ's name, amen. Here it is, my alabaster heart. I'm keeping nothing back from who you No hidden treasure fell by key your lock. You're a lifetime worth of worship, and it's only just the start. Here it is, my every waking day. The minutes, hours, the years of endless praise for your word. Far beyond all I could say There's a lifetime worth of worship In the nuance of your names So let it rise like incense My whole life a fragrance Every ounce here broken actually Every breath
church family. We're so glad that you were able to join us for week one of our brand new relationship series. And Lord knows we can use all the help we can get right now with our relationships. I'm sure you agree. Hey, if you haven't yet let us know that you watch the service, please do so by filling out the connection card. It's our way of staying in touch with you right now, even though we can't meet physically. It only takes you a few seconds, and it lets us know how we can be praying for you, believing with you that God's going to move on your behalf. And if there's anything we can do to serve you and your family during these days, please, please let us know. Hey, so many of you joined in with us during our reading plan leading up to Easter. It was incredible to know that together as a church family, we were pursuing God through his word and in prayer. One of our, four, one of our four priorities as a church is pursue him daily. And we want to invite you to join us in a brand new reading plan available now on our website at thecompass.net or on our church app. So jump on, let's get in the Word together and pursue Him daily over the next several days. We also want to say thanks to those of you who continue to support us financially, continuing to give and support the work that God has called us to do as a church. Hey, would you believe that since the stay-at-home order went into place, we've had over 40 new households give to the Compass Church for the first time. We want to celebrate that amazing, amazing news. We want to say thank you to the Lord, and we want to say thank you to those of you who continue to give to allow us to do what God has called us to do. Even though we're not able to gather together physically on the weekends right now, you can still give online, even right now, no matter where you are, thanks to technology. And speaking of technology, another thing to be grateful for, my wife Kristen and I have four kids and they miss coming to church on the weekends. They miss Compass Kids. But because of the resources available on our website at thecompass.net, they're able to engage with their lessons on their level every week to listen to our Compass Kids team teach and they can sing songs and they can still worship on their level. And our students, our Compass students are doing the same thing. Uh, they're engaging together on the weekends. They've got resources available. And this is a great way, families, to keep your kids, to keep your students engaged. So if you haven't yet done so, go to thecompass.net, click on the Kids tab, click on the Students tab, and make sure that your kids and your students stay engaged with what we have going on here at the Compass Church. So many of you enjoyed celebrating communion with us on Good Friday. You wrote in and you said, hey, thanks for doing that. It was great to observe communion even from our own home. Well, I wanna let you know next weekend, we're gonna do it again. So go ahead and start getting those elements ready for next weekend. It doesn't matter what type of bread you use. It doesn't matter what type of drink you use, but we just wanna give you a heads up that during next weekend's service, we are going to celebrate communion together again as a church family. 
Friends, we love you so much. We're still praying for you, believing that we're going to be together real soon. And I want you to invite you to continue praying. Let's pray for those on the front lines of this pandemic. Let's pray for those who've been affected by COVID-19. Let's pray for our economy, for our businesses, for our leaders, as they make important decisions on when we can open back up, when we can be together. Keep praying, keep believing. We love you. We can't wait to see you. Have a great, great rest of the week. Bye-bye now.